while we're waiting for Michelle, let's get started with the uh, remote labs part of the meeting. I have taken Chuck O'Cat offline for now, for today, or for some fraction of today. And uh, as I speak, the uh, tools uh, share is migrating back onto the SSD. So it should be fast again, hopefully. Um, and when I'm done with that, then I'm going to shrink the volume that is the home directories and uh, other boot directories for Chaco Cat and move that as well to the SSD. So if all that goes well, and if just moving these things around from, a, from share to share works, then uh, we should be back to being fast. Uh, but I don't know why it's as slow as it is. So there's a possible mystery that may still need to be addressed. Salvatore has uh, found some, some workarounds some using uh, kernel caching. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about that and what you discovered and, and what it takes to get set up. Salvatore, are you there? Yeah, sorry. Uh, the problems with me no, now, I'm fine. Hi, hi to all. All right. Can you tell us about your uh, your solution for using Bcash? <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a solution. It's a kind of workaround. Um, so uh, at the end, it comes that uh, Bcash is uh, um, a component that is uh, uh, able to erase uh, only at the sides of the, of a block onto the onto the underlying memory. And this uh, greatly helps, maybe in uh, because uh, normally SSD anyhow are made by NAND memories. NAND memories inside are um, controllers that uh, are able to um, do a so-called garbage collector, especially when they are under a huge load and a huge write. And if in this condition um, you also uh, ask the memory for reading and to doing a, a write unrelated the 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 job of this uh, uh, this task is very is very huge almost impossible so because memory has, has a um, huge latency uh, they are hidden from the user uh, perspective because there are a lot of uh, dice uh, in parallel programmed in parallel uh, multiplane programming um, uh, and so uh, the um, the big cache seems to me to uh, to reconciliate with the, to 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 know how memory then uh, are good to work with and uh, just do what memory want in in a, in a better way and and this seems that uh, and also uh, I, I then back up this main uh, memory with the with the cache. And the device is uh, anything in Linux. Uh, I actually said to use that ZRAM, uh, that is even compressed RAM. So uh, it uh, add so under heavy write, uh, the the there are two uh, there are better locality because then data are compressed, so uh, are more local, also from the cache perspective from the processor. And uh, obviously the so the the, the written is delayed and then um, is well managed by doing explicitly an erase first and then the write. But this is not rocket science. <laughs> I, know, I just tried and it seems really impressive how easy is uh, to set up, how mature is Linux. Uh, I was uh, really wondering about that. And so I, I, I even created the file <laughs> and this is not optimal. You can create a partition, maybe it's better, I created the file uh, of uh, some gigabyte and I was able to, to have this kind of uh, speed in booster. So no more errors when having a Linux build and it seems like a normal device. Yeah, I believe the file is what is actually recommended nowadays for backing store rather than a partition. Uh, but other than that, it sounds like good stuff. Um, I don't understand why there were errors, though. I mean, that stuff's supposed to be abstracted 
even if it's slow, it ought to still work. But who knows? Now there's Michelle. You mentioned it, that the, the same drive uh, has the parity. So it's under the, uh, some interest coming from the wave, the zero wave uh, array, and uh, from the interest coming from the uh, current, uh, our current big uh, right? In, in my ears, your audio has faded out to almost nothing. Is that what everybody else is hearing? Uh, uh, yes. So uh, you mentioned that the big the, the drive uh, is also part of the, um, of the, of the party to uh, a wide array and also uh, is under the, uh, the load of uh, the, the big, our big uh, partition. Is it right? It was good there for a second. And then it faded out again. But I think if I, if we listen to the recording, I think we can probably hear most of it. Hi, sorry, sorry, I'm late. Unavoidably delayed. No problem. Hi, we started out with the uh, PFP for the uh, remote lab part. No, no, no sorry. So uh, I I experienced that this is kind of seems to work. So if you are able to solve in a better way, <laughs> I think it's far more better than uh, than this. Uh, otherwise, this is a kind of backup uh, of. Okay. okay well, I appreciate your working on it and coming up with something that worked for you. Um, hopefully the SSD will, will be sufficient. Um, we'll find out here pretty soon. Please thank, uh, thanks uh, kernel developer <laughs> more than me. And uh, uh, also uh, I asked for the, which is the device then the, the, the physical device we are running on, on this big partition. Maybe we can have a look into how uh, is organized internally to understand if um, there are some, uh, we can uh, explore some suggestion on how to, how to better match the, how physical devices organized. This is something that should be transparent, but at the end, nothing is transparent. In some condition, it are transparent and uh, uh, microcontrollers are working hard to uh, behave like transparent uh, to, to boost performance. But at some times, especially when a garbage collection come in, uh, <laughs> The, the, the performance really degrades a lot. Yeah, for, for files that are stored on the array, uh, it's a little hard to put your finger on exactly what the physical device is because it's more of a virtual device uh, backed up by physical devices. Uh, but I, I put an answer on the Slack for what actual physical devices do hold the files at the moment, but that'll be obsolete by the time Choco Cat comes back online because we won't be using that for, uh, for tools anymore still be true for uh, for big, which is going to be always a trade-off between speed and size. Paul, well, uh, the big partition uh, where we have our home directories, uh, will that also move to SSDs or it will stay there? Well, the, the big directory is not where your home directory is. It's an additional place where you can store files. Your home directory is in, on the main VDisk. And the, Main VDisk will be on the SSD, but okay. under your home directory in twiddle slash big, mm -hmm. uh, that will be on the array and that will stay slow because we don't have an infinite amount of SSD. Okay. And uh, uh, how much, um, and to remember how much uh, space is allocated for our home directory? The total for everybody, for yeah. uh, all of the, uh, all of the VMs plus other uses of the cache is uh, one terabyte. And so the per uh, user, pardon per user will be no, that's total per user uh, is not alloc not set. There's no quota per user. Ah, okay. Uh, I don't expect to add one unless we really have trouble cooperating with disk space. Um, I, there will be a limit per VM. And mm -hmm. I will be deciding that and setting that sometime in the next couple of hours, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm expecting it to be 200 or 300 mm -hmm. uh, gigs okay. so that we have room for a couple of them and still have some cache space left. Okay. Now, you're, you're welcome to put stuff on the SSD, uh, even if it's big, as long as it doesn't overfill uh, temporarily. If while you need the speed. And then if you just want to save it, uh, 
then it needs to be pushed back into the into the big directory so that we don't over allocate the, the SSD. Yeah. And there's a further option which will, remains mm -hmm. available to us, and we may have to go to that if if all of this doesn't work out adequately, which is to simply buy an SSD for each VM, and um, and dedicate it. And then we'd have however much SSD space we bought a terabyte or two, uh, probably. Um, for each, yes, for each VM that we provide that way. Yeah, uh, because I'm coming from the background, like I have my full development environment um, set up over there. So it's kernel, U-boot, um, this uh, hardware stuff. So everything is in there. So I want to do compilation over there in my home directory, everything. And moving from home to big is not an option. Then it will take, uh, it will consume a lot of time. So yeah, you, um, you want to do it while you weren't there. It's yeah, like, like when, so when you were done for the day, you could push it up to, to big. Yeah, or otherwise, I think it, it won't take more than 100, 150 gig. So I think it should be good enough for my home directory to stay my development environment to stay in the home directory. Yeah, a, yeah. a full root file system is probably only about 10 gigs, right? So maybe a little more than that. Mm -hmm. So unless you have lots of them saved, you should should be fine. I hope so. If not, then we'll have to find a way to get more fast, fast storage. I do have some SSDs in hand for a personal project that I can put in the machine right away if, if it turns out we need that. That may happen today if, if things don't work out. Yeah, because uh, working on SATA is totally not possible. I mean, it's, it's impossible. The IO is too slow. Yeah. Well, okay. It's slower for sure. I don't think how much, I don't know, we don't know yet how much of the time is being spent loading stuff off the tools directory and how much is uh, the file IO for the storage. Uh, but we'll try to, we'll do everything we can to make it fast enough. I think that covers uh, what we need to talk about for storage. I'll. As I said before, ChacoCat and Karapi and also the other VMs are offline until I get this all sorted out. I'll have it online one way or another before the end of the day. Uh, hopefully, okay. all fixed and better. Okay. Back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that because the... Um, so we, we have the, the MATLAB install. Um, so maybe it might be good to talk very briefly about that. I don't yet know how to um, most advantageously install our MATLAB license that gives us access to the tools to do uh, MATLAB straight all the way through to HDL. So HDL coder, and also has GPU coder and, and some of the other toolboxes that are not usually available and are definitely not available to the home license. So in, while you're working on this, maybe look um, and see if there's anything that we need to do in order to, to properly install MATLAB. I was thinking about installing it on Karapi so that it would not interfere with ChacoCat and the, the over the air stuff with the 9371. And that may or may not be the best call. So, so anybody that has an opinion about that, let me know. While we're, while we're in the process of uh, configuring and reconfiguring and, and optimizing. Yeah, the other obvious alternative would be to install it in its own VM so it oh. didn't interfere with either of the hardware setups. Um, but whether that's convenient or not depends on exactly what sort of things you're trying to do with it. If you're trying to go smoothly directly through the uh, construction of a, a HDL and then compile it with Vivado and then load it into the processor, then it would have to be on one of the yeah. hardware VMs. Yes, Vivado is necessary for this because that it bolts up to, to Vivado as far as I can tell, um, or that's, that's what they say. So that's at the brochure level. And what yeah. we need to do is move past the brochure level, you know, past the contract level and past the deliverables of the, the code level, you know, and then actually see what happens. Because as we all know, those those two things are can be very different experiences. Um, yeah. I'll see what I as can long do. As as long as we're not required, it doesn't turn out that we have to uh, get rid of the tools directory and have everybody have their own copy of the tools, then having Vivado available doesn't hurt. 
uh, even if it's a separate VM. Uh, okay. Only if you have to actually have hardware available on the same platform as MATLAB that we'd have to put it on to Karapi or Chaco Cat. Okay. All right. Well, I won't. I won't interfere because it sounds like it's. You said it was going to be offline for today to to fix all the things with the I/O problems. For for some of today, hopefully not all of today. Okay. Good. Let's uh let's be optimistic. Okay. Thanks. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of really good work, and uh, we'll get it. We'll get it working. The before we move on, do you have an idea how large the uh, MATLAB install is going to be? No, no, I do not. Okay, thanks. Okay, so very brief Hamcation update. Um, this is all good news. Uh, so we, we had a booth uh, at Hamcation, which is a, a amateur radio event. So it's a, one of the largest conferences in the United States. Uh, possibly becoming the largest because it, it is competing with Hamvention in Ohio um, for, for the largest. This, this year, ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, selected Hamcation in Orlando, Florida as their um, national uh, conference as well. So this was a, somewhat of a combined event. Um, lots and lots of people there. And for an event coming out of COVID, uh, it was uh, pretty well attended. Uh, we noticed at the booth that attendance was really high in the morning and then dipped for lunch and then never really recovered, which was, was interesting. Um, we have lots of people that were very interested in what we do and want to join or contribute. So I'll be responding to all of them today. Lots of people that wanted to sign up for the mailing list. And um, I'd say, a majority of the people who talked to in, in detail uh, didn't know about us and didn't know what we did. And then maybe 30 or 40% were dimly aware or had heard of us before. Uh, everyone was delighted. So we had a, a solid, good experience talking to people. Um, In-person events, this is, this is really why you do them. Um, and yes, it's very difficult. To, to pull it off and there is there, you are taking a risk still with COVID to do it, but it, 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 it was very, very good to do. Um, so lots of good news from there and you may see some new people on Slack as a result uh, or at least on the mailing list. Um, so word was, word was spread. I was able to give a presentation about digital technology, like in general, why is it so cool and what exactly are we doing about it at the ARL uh, forum. Uh, which was on Thursday. It's a separate event before Hamcation. And o Open Research Institute sponsored uh, a whole um, day-long forum track in the, the Hamcation forums. So a variety of people spoke. And I'll be uh, writing up a report and sending it out to the mailing list and posting it on Slack with some details about that. So that was, it went well, better than I expected. Um, we're all super tired. Uh, because it's hard. <laughs> and after not having to, done an event like this and not doing booth duty uh, for two years nearly, um, well, it's, uh, it's a workout. Our next big event online is something that Sawato is going to be deeply involved with, and that's Ham Expo is going to be giving a, a presentation about LDPC encoding for what, in, on our platform. And if you saw the Technical Advisory Committee meeting, you saw a preview of his ridiculously amazing slides with animations that show LDPC, holy crap. I think people are going to be blown away. Um, so we've consistently delivered really good uh, presentations to Ham Expo and Eric Guth uh, has written me several times to highlight how happy he was with with the previous work, uh, such as Anshul's presentation, which was uh, got a very high uh, rating from the he wanted Eric wanted me to know this, so I'm I'm sharing it uh, with you all. But but uh, er, Anshul got a very high rating. The uh, people that watched the talk were were dumbfounded that they understood it. <laughs> which is so you go to a very highly technical talk and you get somebody that's actually explaining it in a way that can be understood um so anyway that that feedback eric wanted me to hear and also the other people that spoke over the past couple of, uh six months ago and then a year ago were were complimented so we we went ahead and did did something at perham expo we bought a, a virtual booth um because of feedback from us um, nonprofits now get a very, very good discount for booths at, um, at Ham Expo. So we will have one. It's an Open Research Institute booth. So pe people can hang out and we can put additional videos there that we can do at the last minute uh, or up to the last minute, pretty much. And then we can also have PDFs and, and, and we can 
host people and answer questions. So I'll put more of that um, out very, very soon since we're back from Hamcation. And then the next biggest in-person event, which is a large demo opportunity is going to be late in the summer. And I've forgotten the dates already for DEF CON, but we are, we've been accepted as a part of RF Village. So this is the largest radio frequency related village at DEF CON. It's the site of the Wi-Fi CTF. And um, the people that run it are huge fans of what we do and are very supportive. So we will be in Las Vegas, Nevada for DEF CON, and we will coordinate uh, several demos of things over the air. I would like to bring, if not the entire remote lab, and set up the remote lab at DEF CON to show people what's accessible to them as open source um, you know, enthusiasts and developers, then at least a big part of it, and to show our stuff working over the air. We've been given the green light for M17 related demonstrations to connect up different villages. And we've been given the green light to uh, record or broadcast uh, talks at RF Village to have their own speaking track and to transmit it using our software. So our firmware, our, our stuff. So if you, the things that we're working on now, like the encoder and the DVBS2 and S2X, those things can be used um, live to transmit part of the, uh, show uh, and anything else that we can think of really that's um, within the realm of physics, you know, impossibility. Uh, so that's about six months from now. It seems like it's far away, uh, but it's really not. So, so we'll just continue working towards um, providing some demonstrations there. Since it's within driving distance from here, it's a lot easier to bring equipment to DEF CON than it is, say, Hamcation, which is all the way across the continent for me and requires plane travel. Uh, so lots more about that coming up uh, in, in writing on Slack and um, the list. Okay, so that for... In other words, for, for both remote labs and for the FPGA development, this is a big event that we can demonstrate stuff for. All right, so that's it from, that's it from me. Um, FPGA stuff, we're, now we're kind of stuck. We have tried two methods of, of putting our intellectual property into the uh, analog devices reference design. We've tried using the, uh, start with the reference design and then incorporate our IP. And then we've tried a, a really kind of cool, innovative approach from Swato, where he starts with his uh, encoder and then tries to pull in the um, the reference design. And so I'm going to stop talking and listen to uh, any updates on that and how it's going and how we can get it to work. Because I think once we get it to it be incorporated in the design, and this may just be held up by the tools problems that we're having, like when you said two hours to start the to, to get the block diagram up and running that broke my heart because that should not have, it should not be like that okay so i'm going to stop talking and listen to any updates about uh, getting our encoder decoder whatever working in the reference design uh, yeah so i i, I put the um, yeah essentially i am cloning the repository and uh, running the standard flow until the block design um, is um, built up by the tool. Um, actually, no, sorry, let me correct that. So the way I'm doing it is uh, the, the, the DVB encoder has a tickle script and, and, and they, so I think, a make file. And so the make file will clone the analog devices repository and then sort of patch a tickle script to say, you know, source this other tickle script and then, you know, launch the regular um, build process um it's just, yeah that works and i th i i don't remember exactly who f did something with the license but the it worked in the in vivada 2021 dot some one i think it, it worked with the vivado at the you know at the latest from an old devices repository i think it completed i didn't get to you know try that on on the card itself i th i think it might be like it is a good idea to maybe start with you know booting the card via sd card as usual um, and then just use jtag to program only the fpj and do a warm reboot to see if um analog devices the the thing doesn't and uh, the sd card image doesn't overwrite 
the bitstream and that is sort of a hacky way to get it to, you know to work um but the thing is so i was looking at so this is one thing yeah i was looking at pluto's um, sdr and and i realized that uh, like the way i connected the encoder is not exactly how like it's not going to work because essentially when we configure the dma so we, we select files via the iio oscilloscope um, and, and there's two channels and the software side will write to memory um there's like side by side I think it, it, it's four bytes from one channel and four bytes from the other and interleave them like this. Um, and they are de-interleaved um, in the PL side. <clears throat> but the problem is this inter de-interleaving um, also um, converts from AXI to non-AXI. And so on the AXI side, the data is interleaved. And on the non axis side, uh, there is no back pressure. So, like the encoder, uh, it, it doesn't buffer anything. Like it, it needs um, to be able to apply back pressure. And so, what I'm planning to do is looking at how data arrives in the axis stream side. Um, because I think the the interleaving is not hard. So it's essentially you know we have an interleaved stream. Uh, we deinterleave, apply um, or insert the encoder in one of the sides of the stream, and then merge them together. Like in in Axie, that this is 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 it's not hard. Um, it's also not trivial. <laughs> you know, it's doable. It just it just takes you know a bit of time. Um, and then feed the the components. It's called the TXU pack. I think it's unpack. It stands for unpack. And everything should work. Um, so that's where we are at, really. Okay. What What do I need to do to help? So um, let me see. I have on so when Chococat is back, uh, we can try the. Um, actually, I can build a flat out unmodified version of analog devices stuff, a, a bit stream. And then we can power on the ZC706 from SD card, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, we've Then done. program the FPGA, yeah. Yeah, we've and done that. And then program the we've... FPGA and warm reboot to see if uh, this the new bit stream sticks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, is, is this is C seven or six with uh, in, in near you, Michelle? It's uh, just uh, like physically. It, yeah, it's next door. It's uh, it's actually at Paul's house. Okay, yeah. So well, if <laughs> if there's a pair of hands just to toggle the switches, right? You know, it, it's enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, w what we'll do is we'll be on all, on high alert then. Just whatever it takes to get it working, and and I know that. Um, I think Anshul found a lot of really good things about the um, uh, FPGA manager for the in the in the, the, yeah. the device tree and the overlays and stuff like that. And I, it looks like that might, or it looked to me like that might be the easiest way to do it. But then he he explained to me that that um, that having you know for long term it, it would, for long term we don't really need this, but like for now when we're doing experiments, um, so. I will, I'm going to defer to Anshul. He might have a good solution for this. Yeah, so yeah. Um, oh, it, if if he gets this to work, then obviously we don't need the warm reboot hack stuff. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So yes, um, so device tree overlay uh, and that FPG manager is needed if we have PS running. And while the PS is running, we want to program PL. Now for testing stuff, um, as Suwato mentioned. Uh, so the workaround that I'm trying to do is uh, I have this, uh, I'm building my own kernel and I have this uh, ready-made BSP from ADI, uh, but I'm building my own kernel. So with ADI drivers, again, the kernel that has been provided by ADI. So um, 
doing the menu config, selecting its configuration, and then building it. And then I want to load uh, through JTAG both the PS and the Bitstream simultaneously. Bitstream is uh, again from a same uh, uh, example from ADI. So uh, they have this uh, uh, ZC706 example with uh, uh, ADR9371 and JEST links. So I'm building that example. Genera I generate the Bitstream from there. Then I am trying to load both Bitstream and the PS simultaneously. That simplifies the things for us. We don't need FPGA manager. We don't need overlay. And we don't need uh, to boot from SD. We, I can boot it up from uh, JTAG. Well, so, all of that is really good news. That sounds like what yeah. we should be able to do. Yeah, this is feasible. This is very much feasible and it's easily doable. Only part I'm remaining, I, rest everything is complete. Only thing is I need to build the kernel and okay. then it should be good. But for past a uh, couple of days, so this I did last last week and for past couple of days, I have been involved with Codec2. So uh, I'm getting up to speed over there, uh, talking to uh, colleagues over there and going through uh, the talks and YouTube uh, links. So yeah, that's my progress. Yeah, that's that's great stuff too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else with a, a report about what they've done, what they're going to do, any resources needed or Roblox? So um, I, I, you you, you want to go first? It's it's all right, Salvatore. No, no, please, Salvatore, go on. No, so just sorry, real quick. So um, Everest said so he has um, the Bluetooth SDR, and it might be um, so like so there's two things. One is like getting the IIO oscilloscope to work with our bitstream, and there's the um, putting the encoder in the correct data stream. Uh, for this second part, I think we can use Pluto SDR, like Everest has um, Pluto SDR with him. And like, I essentially just need to say, look at what the files look like, see, you know, see what the files we load look like. And say we one file is just, I don't know, ABC, ABC, and the other is just like a ramp or, yeah. you know, known patterns. So if I use, if we can add the ILA to the uh, to that part, to that bus, I can see you know how data looks like and how it splits. So it, that that should be easy to replicate in SIM, and then I can you know move go on from there and okay. have the, the encoder in the, the stream. So okay, do you, do we need to add a Pluto SDR to the lab? Um, I th I think for now I. Th um, I don't know. I, I don't have one. I, I was <laughs> going to rely on Ever East. <laughs> um, yeah, I have. I, I appreciate I have, uh, yeah, we have a couple here. I have one that I was using for uh, for trying to work on the uplink, um, the AXM zero F two forty three chip that we are looking at using for for the uplink. Um, and so there's some experiments here. So, but I have a Pluto that's mm -hmm. pro probably a little bit underutilized. I mean, it can use any any SDR for receive. Uh, so I have a Pluto SDR, and I think Paul might have one too. So if it would help to have one to com to do compare and contrast, uh, or to to you know to rough things out in the in the yeah. lab, then we can add it. Um, but yeah, I think any any sort of leverage that we can get from Everest's success with the Pluto, um, and then look at that, like okay, here's how it gets working over the air, because that's exactly. what we want. Mm -hmm. Then then to so whatever it takes, however I can help. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, just, cool. yeah. Cool. Okay, no problem. If I can uh, help you on the on the Pluto, I can uh, make uh, Pluto uh, reachable also from a lab, uh, from my side. Um, and, uh, well, flushing the Pluto is uh, quite easy. So uh, you don't need any... <clears throat> uh any hand to switch uh, sd card or something like that uh yeah. or could be uh, reprogram uh, easily 
so the just for the uh, the presentation, uh, I try today to uh, integrate the the encoder uh, on the on the pre-tool, and uh, it seems to nearly work. But uh, Andre say uh, it's not okay uh, because we need uh, well. Uh, there is some timing uh, issue, but uh, I, I could try to share you. Uh, oh no, I couldn't share my screen. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I might. I might be able to fix that. Yeah, sorry. It no? defaults. It defaults to where it. Yeah. Okay. I think I fixed it. So you should be able to share. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So I don't know if you can see. Yeah, it looks great. My screen. Look at okay, that. It's so... beautiful. Look at those beautiful <laughs> block diagrams. I love it. it. It's beautiful, but it doesn't work. But um, oh, it's, that's OK. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a beginning. Sorry for that. Um, the idea is uh, to first to see if the block, uh, the UVS2 encoder uh, suits in the Pluto. And uh, as you can see here, we are at 80% here, 80% of uh, usage of DSP. Yeah. I need to remove uh, the, the interpolator, the decimator, and, the, and only two channels to the Pluto because else uh, there is no uh, room left. So. It's uh, really, really tiny. Uh, I hope to, um, it could be interesting to have uh, the, uh, this running on the Pluto SDR, but it's, uh, it's, there is not a lot of place. Um, uh, the, other, uh, the other way, um, I mean, well, I begin to uh, know, uh, well, all the build root stuff and uh, the Linux um, and uh, well, and the FPGA warm up and etc. Uh, well, it's uh, it's uh, well, it's a knowledge I have now. Uh, so if with this tiny uh, platform, it could be uh, useful for you. Um, then it could be good. And the, maybe the other, uh, the other way is that, uh, well, many people have uh, Pluto SDR. So if they want to uh, replicate, replicate it, that it's uh, maybe uh, a good opportunity. Uh, so I try to, uh, to help Andre and if he wants any information, I can, uh, um answer easily oh, uh, i tried to answer his question and uh, put a, a platform a pluto sdr here thank you that's fantastic <laughs> yeah thanks thank you i i, I need to um, see what you know how what pluto sdr can do as in i can you add the, the you, you know vivado ila have you Used it before. No. Uh, it's Sorry. called. It's used ILA internal logic analyzer. Ah no. Okay. Uh, on the <laughs> as I said, you uh, on the on the <laughs> FPGA side. I'm I'm trying to. Uh, well, the learning curve is uh, it's quite long. I try to uh, yeah. train myself, and uh, because there, there is not a lot of uh, helpful uh, people uh, around around me. <laughs> so sorry, yeah. uh, um, but if you want, I can also. Um, uh, well, I have a Vivado here, and maybe you can uh, you can uh, access it to uh, learn remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I th yeah, this info should be yeah yeah we we, we can we can try. Um... Yeah, let's try okay. it. I mean, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna take some work. It's uh, you know, 
and some stuffing and some cramming and some stomping on it to get it in there. But, you know, it's in the realm of possibility if we're efficient and clever. Wait, do, do you have a Pluto SDR connected? So it connects to USB directly, right? Yes. No, well, I, uh, here I have two, uh, two solutions. I have uh, Pluto through Ethernet and, mm. um, and through USB. Uh, for the USB, what is uh, quite um, helpful is the DFU uh, mod, which means that you can uh, run your Bitstream and uh, even all the uh, all the Linux plus the Bitstream uh, directly on the RAM, so you don't need to flash it uh, before trying. Okay. It. So it's it's very it's very quick. Yeah. So. When you when it's on the USB, so the way um, this generally works is you would go to the hardware manager on Vivado, and it you select um, I I don't remember remember the name. Like it, it, usually it it has a target. Like it knows what target you know from the I don't know USB identification or something. And then you like you should be able to see the devices on the JTAG chain. So if if you have the if you have Pluto as they are in the USB, now like you, you can literally go to the Open Hardware Manager to mm -hmm. see you know if that if it detects. Um, okay, I could I could try to do that. Yeah, yeah, we we, we can. It's, it, it should be as easy as that to find out if it is possible to look at the bus um, because essentially the, the, the JTAG um, allows us to, it has some control and it, it will insert a, like a, 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 a monitor of sorts mm -hmm. and we, we can say, you know, I want to sample data when the valid is high or, you know, something is high or certain yeah. conditions. And it will say it can sample like 1,000, 2,000 um, samples and then send them back via JTAG. Okay. So it's sort of an out of band mode. Yeah, um, but but I need to uh, to have a JTAG attached, right? I sometimes or the thing is also like, if you can program the flash, it probably uses JTAG. Uh, because it, it makes sense, like JTAG is used for like manufacturing stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So when you know when they they are manufacturing the thing, they just plug into a USB and do whatever programming and checking they need. So the the chain is probably exposed via uh, JTAG as well. Okay, like the JTAG right now, chain. I don't. I don't have. I, I never use JTAG right now. Uh, mm. Okay. Yeah. So the bitstream yeah, is I, done through USB. Yeah, yeah, but so the JTAG usually we use like a USB to JTAG um, bridge, and gen some cards um, have like a built-in this built-in in the card, and some cards like they don't. So we we need like an external thing, um, like the old RS two three two kind of okay. stuff. Um, but in this case, I think this should be like a USB switch, you know, with the regular data stream to communicate with the, um, uh, the PS mm -hmm. and another one that communicates with the JTAG. Yeah, I, I can look it up and I will let you know. Yeah, okay. sounds like a good plan. Yeah. All right. Hey, any anyone else with any reports or plans or resources needed or uh, roadblocks? Okay. All right. Any last comments before we close? Well, thank you, everyone. It's a huge. Uh, and very generous donation of time to do these sorts of very difficult things, um, but it will succeed and it will be very useful and uh, a wonderful thing working over the air.
all right we'll uh, we'll be at it there'll be updates about uh, choco cat and the repairs to the io um so i anticipate that the performance will get a lot better if there's anything else that we need to know about or attend to then she's, please just let us know okay okay cool thank you awesome all right plenty to do see you on slack let me know if you need anything or if you hit any roadblocks all right bye -bye. thanks bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.